We see not with our eyes, but we need our eyes to see. Goethe's method is a cognitive method. The type, the type of the type of the animal, its essence or form, is not the empirical sense. You're not seeing the horse with your eyes. You're seeing it with meaning. Otherwise, you see all you see is a collection of cells put together. Robots do that. Uh, there's nothing behind what you see, and this happens in palpation as well. If you saw that, if you say a horse as a collection of cells, as a collection of parts, it would be meaningless. It's meaning to which you see the horse. So we think we see the horse, we're unaware of doing the seeing of the horse. We're not passive. We're unaware of the process of that perception, right? I need to bring that into awareness. It is a smooth process based on theory, theatetus, theatre, what I'm seeing. I do not see the same thing you see when you look at the same horse I'm looking at, I can promise you. So theory means to see or behold. Our seeing is grounded within our theory, so all we've got to do is either have theory and realise we're having it, or not have theory and control it. We, it's not intention, it's attention. Eight is very, very attentive to the parts, but even though it's attentive to the parts, his consciousness, he knew it was the whole. He was seeking the whole through the parts, which is what Borta kept going on to be about. We need to see the whole, we need to see the whole force. We need to, we need to disrupt the process of seeing. I need to disrupt the process of seeing to make you aware that you're seeing. Okay, we are then in control of what we see, the same as power patient. Once we disrupt things, more to seeing than meets the eye. This was a guy called N um, Norwood Russell Hansen, wrote a brilliant book, and he said there's more to seeing than meets the eye. What is the difference between one who lives with horses and one who doesn't? Again, you see, I see them differently to you. Um, do they see the same horse, or do they see the same horse differently? I look at something and I see it. The physiology books make us passive in the seeing process. This is known as prevailing presupposition. Light enters the eye and we see, which I just told you, is a prevailing presupposition. It doesn't exist. This is known as empirical knowledge. The Asians said that the animals are taught of taught of thought, that should be, through our organs. Let me add to this, so are men, that they have the advantage of teaching their organs to return. As in being in control, what we experience. In several places in Goethe's scientific writings, we find the suggestion that we can use, in addition to our conventional perceptual apparatus, our imagination, or what he calls the mind's eye, or Geister's alga. We need to deepen the experience of seeing and palpating the horse, not the experience of the horse. Reflecting on what was experienced is introspective and not dynamic holism. This is reflecting on the past, not the process of presenting, as in a verb, as in doing. The process of presenting is true, is true objectivity. We become the object we observe, we become the horse. Now here's Dr. Still's method. I see first the bony framework, I, I am seeing in my mind's eye the nervous system. I, I see, it's, I see, I see, I see. Not hear, not listen. The idea of listening in cradle came from um, Arthur Becker, who was not very happy with the way science was going. So rather than study science properly, he spoke about listening to tissue. In science you don't listen, you see. Theory. This is from the Lenten Shadow of 80, still by um, Arthur Hillis. Okay. This is why I have my fun by disrupting your world. <laughs> the same process can be used in palpation, which we do when we do a three-day course. Okay, I'm now going to stand out of the way. Okay. What I need you to do for me is look. Don't look at me. I need you to look at the object in front of you. Hands up, you can make it move. Quickly, 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 keep your lap lovely, our hands down. Okay, some of you are still stuck, good. So we, 
we're both looking at the same thing, but not, we're both not, two groups are not seeing the same thing. One's, one's up there, one's down here. Okay, now, just make it a bit easier. Not a lot more. <laughs> we have two walls. <coughs> once I put A and B in, you can see the shift. You're making it, it's called a ground figure shift from Gestalt psychology. You're making it move. It's not moving. Where is the movement happening? It's you. You're, that's not moving. You're making it move. Motion does not occur out there. Motion occurs in your consciousness because of relativity and, and part to the part. Everything else is a movement from one part to the next. Now, here's how, here's how you palpate. Now, first we do it by vision. I'm rushing this because it's going to hurt most. You can, I'm going to get you to hold that cube open. This is a patient. These are tissues. These lines can be a horse. How, when I put my hand on the horse's head, can I take this horse's head from this position, like I did with you, to that, to that distance, so I can see more clearly? You're going to hold that open for me by very simple instructions. I'm going to give you theory. I'm going to tell you what to see. What you're doing, the reason why it's shifting, is because while you're looking at A, you're thinking of B. You're not catching yourself doing it. Look at A, think of B, and that cube will stay open. It's shifting more, and I've told it's going to shift more and more and more. Quickly, 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 quickly. Right, now, this is how, this, this is how I now make this head this thing. I am thinking my right hand, I am sensing my left hand. It takes practice. This horse head will go boom in front of me. I can now see. I'm thinking one hand, I'm sensing the other hand. I'm seeing A, I'm thinking B. I'm moving my conscious, the expansion is happening to your senses and your rationalism, your thinking. That's how I palpate. That's how AT is still palpating. You can see more clearly. This has never been taught to you. I can see that by the looks of your faces. This is how you palpate. This is how you see. Those who like ducks will see ducks first. Those who like rabbits will see rabbits first. Those who like both. Some, some people will never see a rabbit and some people will never see a duck. This is not shifting, it's your consciousness that's shifting, with your senses helping you. Right, I, one, next, next picture I'm going to show you is going to be really difficult for you to speak. You must not speak. I will give you the instructions. <coughs> Everyone's shifting now. <laughs> Do not speak. Don't even say hello to the person next to you. I will give you the instructions. Okay, are you ready? I'm disrupting your thought processes. Do not say a word. Now, hands up who sees what is on the picture. Okay, and those who put your hands down. Hands up who those who do not see what's in the picture. Right, now, everyone's sensing the same thing. But not everyone is making sense of the same thing. I will now give theory to those people who do not see what's happening here. They will suddenly see it. It's not a sensory phenomenon, it's a cognitive phenomenon. This is the giraffe's head. Okay? So those who didn't see it before will see it now, because I've now administered theory. Nothing has changed here, it's here that's changed. The first edition of Nature, 1869, was a poem by Goethe about nature. Things have changed since then, it's all become very mechanical. Hence we can see the individual animal as a small world existing for its own sake, by its own means. Every creature is its own reason to be. All its parts have a different effect on one another, a relationship to one another, thereby constantly renewing the circle of life. Thus we are justified in considering every animal physiologically perfect. What is John say that uh, they still say about perfection? This is where it gets it from. Perfection. The word perfect doesn't mean flawless. The word perfect means wholeness. And this is from Goethe's scientific studies. This is A.T. Still's best friend. <laughs> now you see the snout, do you? You must not think of anything about which end of the hog the snout is in or its use or attachments. You cannot succeed in an investigation in, as an investigator if you leave that snout before you go 
you get the form in your mind. Form in your mind. Now you are the master of the form of the snout. You can look how it is, how, not what, it is attached to the end of something by this time, i.e. look at the snout as a reflection of the whole animal. You see a plow, um, you see a plow to turn the ground, now go, and go from your discovery, discovered plow, to attachment to head, which is fast to the neck, as said, fast means attached to the neck, to the body, till hog is complete. You see the whole hog through the nose, to its snout. Every creature has its own reason to, reason to be, not an abstract generalisation. I'm going to skip some things and we get straight to parts and holes of animals. We have this neo-Darwinian approach towards animals. Uh, we talk about what things are for rather than how things function. What is a hoof for? We shouldn't say what is a hoof for, we say how does a hoof function. This can be different. Um, sorry. We always explain things. Um, mutant traits, the development of horns used for survival. We always explain rather than describe. Horns, butt, eyes here, uh, eyes here, ears here, eyes see, nose smells, explained by functional ends. It's the end, not the process. So, animal lost in the process of abstraction and reductionism. We're losing it by its ends. Um, we use the word teleological, which means sees purpose in ends rather than stated causes. So it's from the Greek telos. So we're completing, it's like looking at a hoof, looking at a node, looking at a jaw. We see processes by ends. So I'm just going to skip again. Because this is going for a long time. Mm -hmm. The what overstands, the how <coughs> understands. What is something for? How does something function? We want to understand but we're not, we're overstanding everything. How is the animal being? How is it moving or gesturing? How is it running? How is it eating? How is it sleeping? So to, to know about a horse, you must know about something else. If you do not look at other animals in comparison, you will not know the difference. Um, I went into the stables last night, and I took, you've got a skeleton of a horse there with a dog underneath it. Look at both. Look at, this, look at the difference, not the sameness from one horse to the next horse, as Plato. What does the horse do that the dog can't? What does the dog do that the horse can't? In the middle is your true understanding of morphology, not staring at something. Oops. So, a grazing horse lives in its food, like that. Um, lips, nostrils and jaw constantly moving, front teeth rip the plants, which I was happy that I put the dance on mentioned it yesterday. Jaws move in a rhythmical, cir circling fashion. How is the horse grazing, not what is it doing? How is it doing it? <coughs> not, not what is it doing, how is it doing it? So the following answer is, mm -hmm. it is doing it by etc, etc, etc. Eats and grinds for hours, not ruminate, because cattle do that. Um, no full chain in the stomach, blah, blah, blah. I know you know all this. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to use this for non-horse people as well, so they can understand better what you're doing. As I understand it. Uh, galloping, okay, so now we're going to look at the patient, which is the horse. You must not go beyond the phenomenon. It's a whole. Understand the whole, not the part. If you look at the part, you've got to think about the whole. If I'm looking at the patient's head, I'm thinking that them as a whole, and I'm myself thinking about them. <coughs> that brings an intuitive sense of this phenomenon out. So uh, Goethe coined the term morphology. We made a mistake here. Motion is not joint motion. You made the cube move, you made the rabbit and duck change. That's not joint motion, that's motion of consciousness. The motion, this, is a, this is moving, as I said before, it's a motion of consciousness. We made that mistake of making motion, of making motion mechanical, making it move by doing this, flexion extension site, this is Cartesian. That's not what still meant originally. The horse is moving by its form or essence, by its bone form. 
the shape of the bones, go and look at that skeleton again. The shape of those bones are already moving, they're moving through time, they're moving very, very slowly through evolution. The door hinges have to have a form, otherwise you can't open and close the door. A tennis ball has a form, it will roll. It has the form, the form is the potential to act. The horse's skeleton is the potential to act. I cannot bend my arm without the form of my bones already having the potential to bend. The form is in the movement. When Aegis examined his patients, he didn't examine them in flex extension, he examined them in the form of their bones. If I asked you to run through a forest in a straight line, you're not going to get very far. The bones of the tree trunks, they're going to hurt. The bushes are the soft, the bushes are the soft tissue. The, 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 the forest dictates my movement. I'm understanding, not overstanding. If I went to the forest with a hacksaw, then I'd be in charge of the forest to get to know it. No, your, your examination process, your thought process should be as flexible as the organism you're looking at, not dominating by preconceived theory. You have to move your consciousness with the horse. You have to be as flexible as nature. It has to happen in you, not out there. This is already moving. It's moving by form. I've got some nice classic photos of how we into them. <laughs> then we have to ask questions. <coughs> Things like, you know, where is the most, these are, these are these descriptive questions. So where, is the mo, where, is, where is most of the limb musculature? It's close to the body. There's nothing down here. Where, where are humans comparable to el uh, elbows and knees in comparison to humans? The, 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 the movement is happening not in the what's happening to your consciousness, the two Q, A, B. This becomes <coughs> meaningful. We don't label these knees and elbows unless we know something else. Again, very close to the trunk. What happens to the, to the number of muscles lower down the limbs? They get, now they, they, they get less and less and less. This is descriptive, you're describing. Dominated by long tendons in the, in the lower down the limbs. They're less elastic. Uh, this less elasticity, what does this mean? It's by function, that means more stability by elasticity. It's elasticity in the tissue that's doing this. This is a case of a, a hardening as we go down, from soft to hard. It's hardening as we go downwards. So, poor fine movement lower down. The movement's up here. Most of the movement's here. Clump, 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 clump. Most of the movement's up here. This means that we can relax the muscles because there's more stability down here. Fewer bones as we go down compared to the lion. I'm going to show you the lion in comparison. You need to compare things. So, the bones are reducing as we go down. Said we said the body weight is in the forelimbs. Radius are on the fuse, straight and stable. All this is contributing to this stability of the horse, which is unstable. These square bones, their form allows the horse to lock in. It's the form. This, these are, you know, if I've got, if I've got a cube here, and then tip the table up, it's not going to shift until I get really to the other end of the table, but a tennis ball, the form is gone. So the form is in the, the, the bones are telling you what the, what the animal's doing. So if I'm looking at a horse from the front, remember, I'm using my consciousness, not my senses. So what I want you to do is look at that. I want you to remember that. Try and hold it in your consciousness while looking at that. This is the A and B of the cube. You're looking at one thing, you're thinking another. What arises out of it is meaning. Now try and remember the front and think, think and look at that. Remember the front and look at that. Just, you, you get 
getting the whole horse to the parts. We, we have three sets of limbs, not two, all mammals have three sets of limbs, not two sets of limbs. A limb is composed of three parts, a long bone, a bridge, and a flat bone. So, long bone, bridge, flat bone, this is scapula. Long bone, flat bone, ischium, and then bridge is this ischium. So, here's the limb of the jaw, so we call this is the long bone. The flat bone's up here, and here's the bridge, here. So we have three sets of limbs. So each limb lives within each other. You, just, you have a problem with the hip, you will have a problem with the shoulder and the jaw. In humans, and it has the same principle has to apply to animals. If I've got someone with complete sciatic pain, I would treat the shoulder, this goes away. You've only got one nervous system. Grey's Anatomy says the nervous system acts as a whole at all times, the separation is purely academic, and I don't see why horse should be any different or any other animal. Um, you cannot know an animal if you don't know the difference. <coughs> so, let's have a look. Just in time. So, here we go. This is the skeleton. Okay. So, going from that skeleton, don't analyse it. Don't analyse it. What we, it's what we call feel looking. Feel what you're looking at. Not with your eyes, with your body, your whole body. Give me some impressions. Which one's moving back, which one's moving forwards? The line inherently is going, to go, is going forward. That's something that arises out of it. More bones as you go down compared with the horse. Therefore, it relates to the terrain in a different way. More backward weight bearing. The reason why it looks like it's going forward, like a because this is the power, it's, it's always... If you see young people that are gymnasts, they're like that. <laughs> Power's from behind, but it looks like it's designed to go forward, as opposed to the horse, which is more stable. What would happen to a lion if it relaxes its muscles? <laughs> exactly. A horse would horse them lock and just go... <laughs> So again, we're looking at the scapula, relation the scapula to the back end, front end, I'm just going to do this again. But you get the basic idea. The length of the humerus and femur. The difference in length. The horse is all here. The lion is coming down into the environment. You, you, I know my, my brief friend with horses, the horse is so sensitive to the environment. The slightest thing. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So therefore the lions put over everything. <laughs> okay, you get the idea now. So these pictures I took last night, you've got you've got the animal here, you've got it, you've got the form here, so we can use it. There's your dog. Look at, look at the teeth arrangement. <coughs> dog can't rotate the jaw because the teeth lock. Chimpanzee can't rotate the jaw because the teeth lock. Different school didn't notice that. Look. <coughs> so, then. so this is what Goethe called an empiric, a delicate empiricism. Very, very delicate empiricism. As it see, see delicately. Once you see delicately, you will feel the animal rather than look at the animal. And I think you're doing this anyway. You have to. It's emotional. All I've given you is a method of doing it on purpose. So that you can develop that deepening of personal experience. And that's what it is. It's a deepening of personal experience so that you can become intuitive with your judgment. It's not something wishy-washy. Go through treaties on intuitive judgment. You only come to intuitive judgment by deepening personal experience. You then begin to think in context. You know that bit over there belongs to that bit over there. And it moves in the rhythm. It moves in distance. It moves in time. You know that, you're looking at something, and you suddenly think, that, I, I know what's wrong here. You don't need someone to tell you. That it comes with deepening of personal experience. What you've done over the years, I presume, is deepened your personal experience by process of osmosis, passive osmosis, of loving horses. This is, the, this is the nasty, horrible, scientific method of doing it. 
So you can teach the methodology of experience to deepen it on purpose. Back off. Be, don't be passive, be attentive, but back off. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Thank you.